The International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska is home to the largest known public quilt collection in the world with thousands of quilts from all over the globe. They have several concurrent exhibits at any given time, both in person and online, and they do much more than show quilts. Today's guest, Leslie Levy, has been executive director since 2014, and we had a chance to discuss all the facets of the museum, the people that make it happen, and why it should be on everyone's bucket list. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Leslie Levy. Thank you, Leslie, for coming on the show. I understand you're coming from Nebraska, and not only are you coming from Nebraska, you are born and bred true Nebraskan. Very close. I was actually born in Denver, Colorado, so I am a lifelong Broncos fan for anybody who appreciates football. I'm the only one in my family, but we moved to Nebraska when I was in grade school. So definitely raised in Nebraska. And before you became the executive director of the International Quilt Museum, what was your exposure to quilting? Quite a bit in the sense that my mother was an antiques dealer. She was a teacher, high school teacher. And um, in the summer, to keep her busy and occupied, she had her own antiques business. And so always was buying quilts and selling them, but she was also a quilt maker. So we always had quilts on our beds. We always had them hanging on our walls or on a chair. Our house was filled with quilts. Quilting was a part of her family history. It was also a part from, of my father's. Uh, my mother's from West Virginia. My dad's from Virginia. So quilting was just always a part of their lives growing up and it was a part of mine growing up. So I knew historical and antique quilts and patterns um, and had that exposure, but uh, modern quilting, art quilting, all new for me. Your museum is so much more than a, an exhibit. And as the executive director, you are the admiral of this whole <laughs> organization. Exactly. How many ships are you actually steering? Well, one of the things that I love about the Quilt Museum is we always try really hard to have a variety of quilt exhibitions up so that at any given time when people come to visit us, they can see and have that exposure to different types of quilt making. I think so often people hear the word quilt and they have a very distinct connotation of what that is or what that should look like. And we love to broaden people's horizons and, and stretch those boundaries. So we always try very hard to have some type of exhibition that it has a historical or antique quilts, something contemporary, art quilts, and something international. So we're always trying, and also community-based. We have a community gallery where people can put in a proposal to have an exhibition, and that might be their quilt guild, it might be a personal exhibition. And so people love to see quilts that are made by their neighbors or by their family members, or um, we work a lot of times with the schools and we'll have students exhibitions in there. So they are incredibly proud to be able to have a quilt hanging in the quilt museum. So how many years in advance are these exhibits planned? We always have our exhibition solidified two years in advance. Usually out four years, we have a rough idea for the next four years what 90% of the galleries are going to have. How has the museum had to pivot in the last two years with all the travel restrictions and pandemic protocols? Right. The pandemic has really changed the way, like everybody else in the world, has changed the way in which we've done business. So often the Quilt Museum is on people's bucket list, which we love. We regularly see visitors from all 50 states and usually 35 to 40 countries a year we have visitors from. Um, so a really fabulous, diverse group of visitors. And all of that came to a screeching halt. And as you can imagine, most of the people here are people, you know, they're extroverts, they love people. <laughs> um, so it was really hard to close. And we were closed from March through August of 2020. So 
one of the things that that forced us to do is to rethink how we approached exhibitions. And I'm really proud of the curators and our communication coordinator and our education programs because they were able to pivot very quickly and started producing online content that we could use for outreach to schools, that we could use to quilt for quilt guilds, for our members, for our donors and supporters, so that they could still feel that connection. We could still be offering them some type of exhibition, some type of programming, lecture series, those sorts of things. And so, you know, there's always silver linings to everything. And there really were some silver linings to COVID in the sense that it enabled us to pivot and we gave ourselves permission to try things that we'd never been able to do before or always felt like whatever was on fire had to, you know, we had to deal with that right then. But we gave ourselves permission to slow down, pull back a little bit and rethink how we can approach some things. And we've had so much fun doing virtual programming. And there's just been this exponential growth within the quilting community because people had to take up new hobbies. Exactly. You know this. Quilters know this inherently. The public is beginning to figure this out. Quilts have always been a vehicle for speech and emotion. Like the quilt behind you, which is so beautiful and colorful. I love it. People were quilting, right? When they were at home. And it was a way for them to handle the stress, the uncertainty, the fear, sometimes the joy. It's hard to think that there's joy in a pandemic, but all of those emotions and things. Quilting was a fabulous outlet for people. And some people picked it up and taught themselves or, you know, had, as you kind of mentioned and alluded to, thank goodness for all of the virtual tutorials that came out that enabled people to learn a whole new skill. And um, boy, are we grateful for it. Well, I often in this pandemic have been thinking of my grandmothers living through World War II and what they had to give up. And I've often just relied on, they got through that. I can get through this, but you have had exhibits of those war quilts Mm -hmm. and the effort that women put into them in those long stretches of time. Yes. Well, and you know, quilts are many things to many people. And the former executive director, the founding executive director of the quilt museum one time said that quilts really are the textile pages of our shared history. And That's a short sentence with a lot packed into it, but really quilts are the textile pages of our history. Like we can learn so much from a quilt, whether it's somebody's story, the fabrics that were available, the thread, the dyes, what somebody was experiencing, where they had traveled. So much like the quilts that we've seen from previous wars or even the, you know, 1917 18 pandemic, there were plenty of COVID quilts made. And it will be really interesting to see how those are preserved and how, you know, in the years to come, what the anniversaries of major milestones are and how those quilts reappear in people's collections or museums and how the story of these unprecedented times are really illustrated. Well, a Cather I believe is a Nebraskan author and she has a wonderful quotation on her tombstone. That is happiness to be dissolved into something is complete and great. And to me, that's about how I feel when I quilt. I know the museum stores and curates and preserves the quilts. Are they preserving those stories that go along with the quilts as well? Yes. I think One of the reasons the Quilt Museum can be that bucket list, that that wonderful journey, the trip of a lifetime, is we are fortunate to have a fabulous room. Uh, It's a conservation room. It's the Byron and Sarah Dillo conservation room, Um, and it has a big glass wall, and you can see the work that's taking place in there as our quilts are accessioned or, or things have come off of exhibition and they're being cleaned. And when I say cleaned, I don't mean water cleaned. We store all of our collection here on the premise. So people can have behind the scenes tours and be able to see where the quilts are stored, how that works. What we do not have on site, but we do have because we sit on the University of Nebraska campus, we have an official archive in the library system. So as we visit with quilt makers, as research occurs, 
as we bring quilts and accession them into our collection, we always ask collectors, family members, and quilt makers if we could have any of the paperwork and documentation that goes either with their quilts or with their collections so that we can keep those stories and those histories together. And those are all in the University of Nebraska's formal archive. So how many quilts are acquired by the museum every year? Do you set a goal or is it just organic? It is organic. And that is a great way to put it. There are some years that are more robust than other years. Sometimes we have amazing, wonderful opportunities that come to us and we just can't pass those up. And so we will bring more quilts into the collection than maybe we had thought we might. On average, we probably bring 300, 400 quilts in a year. Some years, the last few years, strangely have been larger years. Those numbers have been closer to seven or 800 quilts in a year. This year will probably be even larger because we had the amazing good fortune to have the red and white quilt collection, Joanna Rose's um, infinite variety red and white collection that was shown at the Armory in, um, I believe it was 2011. So those quilts are being accessioned right now. And we're just honored to have that opportunity. So when those opportunities present themselves, it's a win-win for everybody because we have the space and the ability to bring in a collection that size and to care for it and steward it and protect it along with all of the archive and the documentation and the photos and everything that Joanna had collected over the 65 years that she amassed that collection. So it's an honor. And how did it come? Did it come just in bags or did it come in boxes and crates or how did she store her quilts? Mrs. Rose was amazing in her respect for and care and love of quilts. So as you can imagine, it was well cared for, well stored. We have been to New York a couple times to visit with her and see the collection and talk about what that process looks like for moving 700 pieces. So we were actually in New York in September, just after Labor Day to visit with her and to oversee the loading of the quilts, which were all packaged and then in boxes and to see those be picked up by art shippers and um, have them loaded in, over, oversee putting them in um, the moving trucks to bring them this way. And it was fun and exciting and, and to hear her tell the stories about certain things that she had done and, and also to visit with her husband and her children and grandchildren. It was a wonderful several days with her. And that just sort of brings in that extra level to the quilt story, doesn't it? It's just yeah. not the making of the quilt and the quilt maker. It's how it came into her hands and the story mm -hmm. and did it show at the big show or not? Or was it a late arrival in her collection? Yes, because she continued collecting. Like she was collecting up to the very end <laughs> and, um, and even more red and whites. So we have the original collection, but there, there are still a few more quilts, but that is a part of our journey here at the museum that we just value so much. And that is those one-on-one -on -one conversations with collectors, with makers, with their families. What inspired them? How, why do they collect? Why do they collect what they collect? How it comes to be, what it means to them. When I interviewed for this position seven years ago, I was talking to the curator of collections, Dr. Carolyn Ducey. And I said, you've been here 15 years. What has kept you in this job, in this museum for 15 years. And she said, quilts have taken me around the world. I said, explain, explain that to me. What do you mean by that? And to listen to her visit and talk about where her job has taken her literally around the world to visit with quilt makers, to collectors, museums, to hear the stories, to live those tales is just fascinating. There's always something new every day. So. There is. I've just mm -hmm. gone down a rabbit hole of Welsh quilts. 
Oh my gosh, and yes. A couple of months ago, I interviewed a young woman from Malaysia, Amira Ameridan. And all of a sudden I had all these people from Malaysia contacting me saying, oh, I didn't know that there were others here. And it is just fascinating how it binds us and the stories, the commonality in our stories. There's so much history in these crafts that we just look at and say, oh, look at that beautiful quilt that you have. Mm -hmm. But you're like, let me tell you a little bit more. <laughs> Did you know? Yeah. Something that you said reminds me that I was in Kansas City, I think it was in October, visiting with a quilter. And she said, quilts are the great connector of people. Small statement, but huge meaning. And we were visiting about the differences that we see when people are walking through the museum and comparing that to what happens when people walk through other types of museums, history museums, fine art museums. We regularly see people as they walk in and they're in the galleries, they're talking to one another, they're talking about the quilt that they're looking at, the color, the design, how it was constructed, what that maker was thinking. They're talking about the history as they read the label. They're talking to one another. Pretty soon somebody else walks by, that person gets into the conversation. You know, the next thing you know, um, there's, there's this energy that's happening inside the gallery. It's not uncommon for visitors to see a tour going by and, and they'll just kind of come along with it. Um, I'm not sure that type of interaction occurs when you're in other museums because quilt makers and artists, they just talk to each other. You know, they have that similarity. They understand and, and are making what they're seeing and have that appreciation. Whereas sometimes you don't always have that same interface when you're in, I mean, I love art museums, fine art museums. I love to look at them. I don't have an appreciation for the skill and the talent. I've never tried my hand at it. So I can't speak to something that I'm seeing on the same level that makers and appreciators and quilt makers and artists have when they're walking through our galleries. So there's just this kind of instant, spontaneous conversation between visitors. And it's so much fun to watch it because as you mentioned, they just interact with one another. They are great, quilts are great connectors of people. Does the museum reach out to other museums and offer them support with their quilt preservation? Yes, definitely. We have fabulous relationships with other quilt museums as well as other fine art museums um, or other museums actually around the world. We do travel different exhibitions or sometimes two or three times a year we're contacted and asked if another museum can borrow a piece in our collection to hang in an exhibition that they're working on, whether it's a fine art exhibition or another textile exhibition. So it kind of depends on what the situation is. People will call us and ask for recommendations on the best way to hang a piece or how to exhibit it. So it's, it's fun to work with other professionals and museums on how to do those. Some of our like hard conservation, when we have a piece that needs to be professionally conserved, there are some conservationists in New York that we work with often, especially depending on those instances when we have a piece that's several hundred years old and it needs something very special. We work with a group in New York. So has the skills or the techniques for preserving quilts, has it changed over the last couple of decades? That is a great question. I, I know how we have worked and how we have managed. We try, when, when a piece comes into our collection, we never wash it because we never know the dyes that are used until we really look and study that. We wouldn't want to risk something happening to the fabric or the dye. So our process when a piece comes in is maybe not what the average quilt maker or artist would think of. When a quilt comes into our collection, 
we put it into isolation. And people, people are always like, isolation, that seems so hard. <laughs> and we're like, it really hasn't been bad. It's, you know, we're, we're just, we're just trying to preserve when you're having a museum of textiles and fabric means that we are susceptible to certain things. So we have to be really careful the minute something comes into our museum to not put our permanent collection in jeopardy at all. So next to our dock area, we have an isolation room and the pieces go directly into isolation. And then those pieces are put into big Ziploc bags and sealed for two weeks. And that will, that lack of oxygen will take out any critters that might that you know you can't see, but that might have gotten into the fibers. And then we use a museum quality vacuum. And um, when they come out of isolation and out of that Ziploc bag, they are vacuumed. So the quilt is put out on the table. There's a really fine mesh screen that is put on top. And then the vacuum is done over it so that it protects the fibers and the threads. And that will pull out any dust or anything. And then everything is stored in acid-free boxes and acid-free tissue and humidity and temperature controlled storage. And we refold our entire collection every two years to prevent <laughs> any fold lines. And we also will take tissue paper and create like a roll to put so that there aren't hard fold lines there. They're softened and you have a little bit of batting in there. We have volunteers who have been refolding our collection for 20 years. And it is a pride and an honor for them. Bless their hearts. They're in every week and they won't retire because they have bragging rights. There are very few people that can say, I have seen every quilt in the International Quilt Museum's collection. So it is a coveted position to get on the refolding. <laughs> Hate to fold and do laundry at home, but happy. Happy to volunteer at the Quilt Museum. The way in which we preserve and protect and steward pieces that come in is a little bit different probably than what people normally think of. Something that is shattering, like if it's silk and it's shattering or something is disintegrating, uh, oftentimes part of that preservation is putting a really fine fabric over that, not to repair it or replace it, but to encapsulate what is beginning to disintegrate so that you can still see what the original pattern was, what the original fabric was. We're just trying to slow that down. Now, you mentioned one thing about the dye, like you don't know what mm -hmm. kind of dye was used. Suddenly I realized, oh, there's so many levels of yeah. quilts and study. Do you get research people coming in from the university and doing internships or PhDs? Yes. So we have scholars and researchers from around the world that call and ask if they can come and stay for a week or more. We've had scholars that have been here for a month before who are using our collection as the basis for the research and the papers that they're writing or the research that they're conducting. We love it. Anytime that we can share our collection with researchers, scholars, we are happy to do that. We're happy to facilitate however we can do that. I really loved the Ken Burns exhibit. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get there in person, but the interview that Mary Fawns did with Ken yeah. on your site, are you going to do more of those? We love to do special exhibitions like that. And we're very fortunate that Ken was amenable to it. And we had fun doing it with him. And having the ability to go to Walpole where he lives and spend some, spend the day with him and talk about his quilts and uh, why he loves them and why he collects them. And he was very generous with his time and his collection. So we appreciate that. We have some really special collections and exhibitions coming up on our exhibitions calendar that are special, like Carolyn Maslumi's collection. We're going to have an exhibition of her collection coming up here pretty soon. It's always fun to do those. 
So whenever we find out about it, we're always happy to uh, research it and find out if that's a possibility because the people want to know, the people want to see it. Tell me about the quilt that's behind you. So the quilt that's behind me is a Rob Peter to pay Paul, very traditional pattern. It is dated around 1880 and it's wool. It belongs in the Robert and artist James collection. It was part of their original collection. It hung in the stairwell of their home. And it's poignant that you ask about it. 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of the Robert and artist James gift of their almost thousand quilts in their collection that they gave to the University of Nebraska. And that one gift started this journey that none of us could have imagined was going to end up with a beautiful museum and a collection of almost now 8,000 pieces. When Robert and artist James gave their quilt collection to the university in 1997, it was with the intention that their quilts be used as part of academic study curriculum, whether that is the care and conservation of textiles, quilt history, etc. What no one was quite expecting or could imagine was the public's interest in seeing those quilts and also the opportunities that came to the university to acquire other quilts or other collections um, or other pieces. And so within four, five, six years of that original gift, um, it became obvious to the university that we needed to build a standalone museum. And here we are. That museum was open um, in 2008. So it's been pretty amazing, um, but it started with Robert and artist James collection. And the beautiful quote behind me was one of those. Well, I know the museum is on my bucket list. And as soon as we are able to travel, <laughs> I'm keeping my fingers crossed yes. either this summer or next summer, but I will definitely be going to the museum and checking it all out. Now, tell me, do you have a favorite quilt within the collection? All these 8,000 quilts, is there one that has touched you more than others? I have lots of favorites, right? It's kind of like, how do you pick your favorite kid? You don't, but there are different styles of quilts that are really amazing. Like we have some soldiers quilts that are phenomenal and they're just dynamic to look at. And the workmanship on them is incredible. And there are beautiful, as you can imagine, beautiful museum quality quilts throughout our collection. I remember walking through the quilt museum before I started as director and they, the museum had an exhibition of new acquisitions. And I was familiar with historical pieces, antique quilts, not that familiar, didn't have a lot of knowledge um, or exposure to art quilts or modern contemporary quilting. So I see this beautiful quilt across the gallery on the wall, and I feel this tingle in the top of my scalp. And it just completely pulled me in. And then I read the label. And it was called Event Horizon. It was made by Joy Seville. And she made it when she was working through the grief of losing her husband. And it's, um, she, she made the quilt, she put it together, she made the quilt. She didn't have a name for it. And her son is a scientist and he was visiting her and he saw it. And he said, mom, that looks like a event horizon. And she said, well, what's that? And he said, oh, it's kind of like a black hole in space. It's that, it, it's that space just before the black hole, that big black deep emptiness that you fall into. And she said, that's exactly how I felt. So I just remember thinking And it was so beautiful. And I, without even reading it, I had this immediate response to it. And that's what quilts do. And that's what quilts do. Yeah, right? Well, you asked about this quilt. And this quilt was 
made by my so sisters. We are a group of eight women. We have traveled together. We've gone on trips together. Mm -hmm. And during COVID, we each produce blocks and one person put them together and everybody got a quilt. And there's a quilt label on there signed by everyone. And it does both. It makes me feel so happy when I see it. It makes me, <laughs> I'm about ready to cry. <laughs> you know, it is so evocative of love and friendship and caring. And they got the colors right. They knew exactly what I wanted. Yeah. And it has such energy. It is one that I keep close. Well, and it's it's fabulous, right? Because and it encapsulates a very specific time, right? And that quilt means something very specific to you, as quilts do for all of us, right? So I have a quick question for you. The quilts that you all made for one another, are they set differently? Yes, okay. they were all wow. different. That's they amazing. All different. And they were made in the colors that each person liked, but one person got a quilt full of baby goats because she was sending us goat videos every day, trying to keep our spirits up. And another one got log cabins, but they were all very colorful the way they wanted. And the ringleader of our group, whose name is Leslie as well, she wanted placemats so that if we ever came over, we would all have our own placemats. That is lovely. So not only are they works of art, but they're, well, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and it's even jumping out at me from the quilt behind you. I belong to a modern guild mm -hmm. and people often have issue with the term modern because they mix it, mix it up with contemporary and new and better where it's not, it's a style. And I look at that quilt made in, you said 1880. Yes. That would hang in any modern collection today. And even the colors, look how beautiful the colors are in that quilt. And I personally had difficulty coming to quilting because I was a businesswoman all my life. And it all got messed up with that whole feminism question. And I knew that it, you talk to many people and you say you're a quilter and they go, oh, my aunt was a knitter. <laughs> and they have just no concept or appreciation for what's going on behind there. Uh -huh. And, but when I look at that quilt, I can see a story. I can see the effort. I was talking to a man last night who's 89 years old and making his last quilt because his eyes are giving out mm -hmm. and he was taught at the foot of his grandmother. And, you know, there's just all these stories attached to it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that is one of the reasons why we try to have different types of quilts and genres of quilts in our galleries at any given time, because we do want people to see the entire spectrum of quilt making. We like to dispel those preconceived notions and ideas of what quilting is or should be. You know, Artistic expression comes in so many forms. I don't know how anybody could ever think that quilt making, regardless of the genre or the decade or the century that they were made, is not art. It is art through and through, through and through. Have you ever made a quilt block? I do not quilt. My mom quilted all the time. Like we never went on a family trip without my mother having her sewing bag. And there was always a project. My mom's hands were always busy. She's uh, there's always a quilt on the floor being laid out in the living room, something. And people will say to me, how can you run the quilt museum and not quilt? And I'm like, well, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you can love quilts. <laughs> because being the director of a museum is running a business. But I'm like, there are makers and there are appreciators. I am fully, like, I love nothing more than to look at a beautiful piece or an innovative piece, to be amazed and in awe of how somebody put something together or their color choices or their design acumen. That's where my joy comes from. My joy comes from seeing it and just being amazed at the human potential. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have that creativity. Well, when you're close to someone who's prolific and good at it, 
especially uh -huh. a mother. There's a whole nother dynamic there. I know my mother was not a person who could sit still long enough to make a quilt, but my aunt was, and my great grandmother was, and my grandmother on the other side. So it takes a particular type of energy, but it also takes time to find your style. So yes. you're not always that comparison isn't there. Thank you so much, Leslie, for being on the show. This has been absolutely fabulous. If people want to visit the museum or follow you online, how do they get a hold of you? We are at www.internationalquiltmuseum.org. And I will say, sometimes people will comment, well, I, I can't be there in person. I understand that. We understand that. That's okay because we put all of our exhibitions online. And again, a silver lining of COVID was we have done 3D tours of our galleries. So you can go in even, you know, we're doing them now as a matter of course. So you can go in and do a 3D tour of the galleries and the exhibitions that are up. And I mentioned it earlier, this year, 2022 is the 25th anniversary. So we will be having um, in our galleries this year, three fabulous exhibitions on the James collection. So we'll do the great masters of the James collection and we'll do some of the studio or art quilts out of the James collection. And then we will also do some international. Um, and again, those exhibitions will all be 3D renderings of those. And then we're also going to install a red and white exhibition. So we will put up Joanna Rose's quilt. So just get online and visit us and then come see us in person when you can. Great. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Leslie Levy. It's truly amazing all the stories and the histories that a quilt can hold and the impact that they can have on us. I hope that you are motivated like me to plan to get to the International Quilt Museum as soon as possible. If you haven't yet visited the museum, either in person or online, I'll leave a link to their website and their social media links in the notes below. You can also support the museum through membership, a donation, or volunteer service, and I'll leave a link to that in the notes below as well. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Suzanne Paquette, author of Modern Memory Quilts. And we will be talking about finding the stories in fabrics so that you can make quilts full of memories. You don't wanna miss it, so be sure to subscribe. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people on this series, let one inspire you. And check out my latest playlist, Sewing Tool Maintenance. Take care, and I'll see you next time.